GPU accelerated graphical software is everywhere. Your web browser, for example, is a real-time graphics application that runs accelerated by a GPU. If money is a motivator for you, GPUs underlie an entertainment industry that's twice as big as movies. There's also been a rekindling of interest in virtual reality recently. Here's my friend Todd to demonstrate. This talk has two main pieces. I wanted to explain to you what it feels like to program real-time graphics applications on GPUs today. And then I want to go through some of the problems with, the, with current programming in ways that I think that our community, the programming languages community, can help. Here's the basic idea. There's software that runs on the CPU that sends commands over to the GPU, which is responsible for drawing pictures and pushing pixels out to a display. The GPU runs a rendering pipeline consisting of a series of stages that are, can either be programmable or they're fixed function baked into hardware. I'm going to be focusing on two of the most important programmable stages, the vertex shader and the fragment shader. Shader, short for shader program, is kind of a vestigial word, but it just means code that you write that runs inside the pipeline on the GPU. The code that you write for the CPU, you write in a traditional language, C or C++, or these days maybe it's JavaScript. And the code that runs in the GPU, these shader programs, are written in GLSL, the OpenGL shading language. Each stage in the GPU accepts information from the previous stage, does some sort of computation, and passes results onto the next stage. And they have this other job, which is to produce some specific outputs for the rendering process. The vertex shader is responsible for determining the position of every vertex in the mesh that's being drawn. The fragment shader is responsible for determining the color of every pixel interpolated between those vertices on the surface of the object. Let's dive in and look at some code. Here's a sample vertex shader in GLSL. It works with the CPU side host code. And look at these in and out declarations. That's what's really key. The vertex shader has some in variables declared to get parameters from the CPU, the previous stage, and then some sort of computation. Here just adds position and disk, which it got from the CPU together, and puts it into this magical, all important GL position variable, which determines the output of this stage. Finally, it has to pass some values on to the next stage in the pipeline, the fragment shader. And for that, it uses an out variable. And this one just copies the position variable into something called frag pause, just a copy of the same value for the fragment stage. The fragment shader declares a variable of the same name, but with the in keyword to say that it is matching up with the frag pause from the previous stage. Here it just takes the absolute value of that and stuffs it into its magical all important GL frag color variable which determines the color of a given pixel. So those are the shaders. Now let's take a look at the host code that runs on the CPU. First, you need to have a place to put the shader source code, which is a string. You can either embed it as a string constant in your program, or you can load it from a file just with fopen. Then you need to ask the OpenGL library nicely to compile your program. Then you need to look up handles for the various in variables you need to send to the first stage in the pipeline. That's just the setup stages, however. Next, you, you need to actually render a frame using this stuff. First, you tell the OpenGL library which program you want to use. Then you use those handles, like this location of the distance in variable, to assign stuff, the parameters for your shaders. And finally, you kick off the whole process by saying, here, OpenGL, please draw this mesh. So that is a really brief tour of what it's like to use OpenGL today. The rest of this talk is, is going to be about pointing out programming languages problems in this domain and presenting possible solutions. There will be straightforward applications of existing thinking. There will be some new work that needs to be done and some problems that I honestly do not know how to solve. Thing number one, GLSL and its relatives, other shading languages, are ad hoc extensions of existing languages with lots of weird quirks. Let's do a, a quick quiz. In GLSL, like in C or C++, you can write struct t, write a bunch of fields, and you declare a new type. What is the name of this type? I'll give you a moment to think about it. The answer is t, because GLSL is like C++. Here's another question. Are declarations of variables allowed inside the condition part of an if statement? The answer is no, because GLSL is like C. It's easy to pick on little language bits like this, but the real point is that hacked up languages are harder to learn and they're also harder to engineer compilers for.
In practice, you need to modify an existing C compiler, like Clang or GCC, to get a GLSL compiler. And this probably isn't good for the quality of, of our compilers. There's some really interesting work that's been going on at Imperial College to apply fuzzing to GLSL compilers. Here's one example of a bug that turns out to have been in a register allocator in a driver from ARM. This kind of bug is a direct consequence of needing to have a hacked up C compiler inside every graphics card driver in order to compile your GLSL from source. The solution here, I think, is pretty straightforward. There's a really deep and rich body of work in our community on extensible languages. Shader languages are just not special enough to warrant their own one-off language design with its own set of weird quirks. They're just normal imperative languages with a few additional extensions and a few restrictions, and they should be implemented that way. Thing number two. You may have noticed in my example that there's a lot of boilerplate involved in communicating between the various stages in the pipeline. When you set things up, you need to look up the location of variables in your shaders. On the CPU, you need to assign into those variables using special API calls. Finally, in the shaders, you need to declare global in variables to read those things. And if you need to pass things from one stage to the next, it's even worse. You need to de declare an out variable, copy things over, and finally declare another in variable to get it in the final stage. The problem here is that even though both C++ and GLSL are statically typed languages, typos and type disagreements can only be caught at runtime when the whole thing is composed together. I can imagine two different philosophies for addressing this problem. In the near term, you can imagine analyzing existing code that consists of a host side language and also a shader language together, applying cross-language static analysis to find bugs in the ways that these various domains interact. In the long term, I think it's worth investigating single source languages that address the CPU and each stage of the GPU pipeline together in a single program to completely eliminate the possibility for disagreement. Thing number three, real graphics programs need to use lots of different appearances for objects, which can mean lots of shaders. But these shaders often share a lot of common functionality to simulate lighting, for example. An alternative is to combine many different, of the many different appearances into one big parameterized shader program, which is no joke called an Uber shader. I did not make that name up. Modern video games can generate hundreds of thousands of shader variants using Uber shaders. Using an Uber shader means cluttering up your program with conditionals based on the parameters from the CPU. Here we have a Boolean variable param that has to be set by the CPU, declared in the shader, and then used in an if statement. Or you might find that it's better to turn a parameter into a compile time parameter, which means in OpenGL that you are using the C preprocessor. This gets rid of the cost of the if, but it adds another cost to switch between shader programs at runtime. This, I think, is an opportunity for anyone who loves metaprogramming tools. If you really like multi-stage programming, for example, or if you like hygienic macros, here's a chance to really let those concepts shine. We're not talking about one-off code generation of a particular configuration of the Linux kernel here. We're talking about generating hundreds of thousands of variants from small numbers of sources. There's an opportunity to stretch the abilities of your favorite metaprogramming technique, whatever it is. Thing number four. There's something interesting going on in the graphics pipeline where each stage, each program, runs at a different rate in time. For example, there's lots of pixels and not that many vertices in a given object. So the fragment shader runs many times per vertex shader execution. That means that this variable fragpause does not get passed directly from one stage to the next. It gets interpolated between the values that fragpause has in the vertex shader for the neighborhood of vertices around a given pixel that runs in the fragment shader. Similarly, in the vertex shader, position just refers to one vertex value. But when the CPU sees the same stuff, it sees it as an array of these vertex vectors. So in between these two stages, there's indexing going on. And these are just three stages. In fact, there's lots of kinds of shader rates that I haven't had time to explain. And people even like to extend the notion of rate to encompass compile time. It's really rates all the way down. So I think there's an opportunity here to stop defining these stages as one-off concepts and study the general theory of multi-write ex execution. This can help better explain what's going on in OpenGL programs 
and also give people flexibility to define their own rates using a common framework. Thing number five, graphics programming involves a little bit of linear algebra. When you're drawing objects, the mesh vectors you get to define the shape of the thing come as sets of vectors that are relative to each other in a specific vector space. The vectors that define this bunny, for example, you can think of as being in a bunny space, and the vectors that define the teapot are in a different space. If you want to draw them together, you need to put them into a common space that we can call the slide space. In order to do that, you use a little matrix that defines the transformation from the model for specific vector spaces into the slide space. And you multiply each vector that makes up the bunny or the teapot by the corresponding matrix. Here's what it looks like in code. The shader needs to take in that transformation matrix and each position vector from the CPU and multiply the matrix by the vector to get a version of the vector in a different vector space. Here we'll take position and turn it into position underscore slide. And of course, you don't just do this for one vector. You might have another thing called normal. And here we're inventing a naming convention. Underscore slide means in the vector space slide. Later, of course, you might want to do some operations on two different vectors. This one is perfectly legal. It produces a vector that's in slide space. This one, on the other hand, is meaningless. But it's totally up to you and your naming convention to keep track of what is legal and illegal. Clearly, there are types going on here. There's an opportunity for research into a type system that can track the vector space for each vector. Beyond just checking things and making sure that programmers don't do the wrong thing, you can also imagine a program synthesis approach, where instead of writing the matrix vector multiplications yourself, you can declaratively ask for a vector in a particular space and let the system choose where to insert the vector for you. Thing number six. A while back, I was implementing a shader. This is the Fong lighting model, which is kind of the hello world of lighting effects. I thought this looked fine, but it turns out this program actually has a bug. It's a bug in one of those boring vector space conversions I was just talking about. Here is the corrected version, which actually looks like a proper lighting model. Now, it's not too surprising that I would write a buggy shader. I have literally no idea what I'm doing. But what is surprising is how long it took me to notice. This was a one token bug. The problem here was the output was so plausible. I looked at this output and I didn't immediately notice that anything was wrong. I just thought maybe gra graphics hadn't advanced that far. This isn't that great of a lighting model. Whatever, it just doesn't look that great. This sort of brings up a philosophical question though. How do we even define correct or define a bug when bugs don't lead to wrong output, just worse looking output? I admit that this problem is vexingly philosophical and I have no great answers to this question, but here are a couple of okay answers. First, we can try to shorten the debug cycle, the time from making a modification to seeing the results of that modification, making a visual judgment, by applying work on live coding so that changes immediately appear. Second, we can apply some work in our community on crowdsourcing to help evaluate the visual quality of scenes, take the burden off the programmer, and shift it onto Turkers, for example. So those are the six problems. Now, I'm under no impression that better alternatives that come out of research are going to immediately supplant something as entrenched as OpenGL. But there are a couple of things that make this particular situation a little bit different than any other situation where there's a legacy API that we, programming languages people, don't really like much. First is that most graphics development that's done today is actually done by a small number of experts who develop monolithic abstraction errors called engines that shield most programmers from needing to deal directly with the graphics at all. They choose from a relatively narrow set of functionality provided by this monolith, which in some sense is sort of sad, but it also means that there's lots of programmers out there who have never written a shader program before. They've never been able to realize the full potential of a GPU. We can reach those programmers. Second, at this very moment, the industry is undergoing a transition. People have noticed that OpenGL is kind of doing double duty as a programming interface and as a hardware abstraction for portability across different GPUs. And it's arguably been doing a bad job at both. So there's been a movement to replace OpenGL with a very different looking API that only does one of these things, that's only meant as a, as a least common de denominator between GPU vendors. And this has created a gap where new programming models can enter.
There's no consensus yet about what this interface should look like between lower level hardware abstractions and the software stack. But it would be a true sadness to recapitulate all of the mistakes of OpenGL over again. We, as a community, have an opportunity or even a responsibility to build something better.